Hi, I'm Suzanne Summers. I just spent a long time talking to Kara, who pulled things out of me that I couldn't believe. Hi, friends, it's Kara. I'm sharing my talk with Suzanne Summers, which we taped a few years ago. Suzanne died on Sunday from breast cancer. Suzanne and I had a really special conversation. She really opened up quite a bit about the ups and downs in her life, her struggles, and a lot more. So I think this will give you a pretty good picture of who Suzanne was. I hope you enjoy it. I've interviewed some of these doctors several times because their information is constantly being updated. So it's very exciting for me. It's how I've gone to school. Mm-hmm. So it's yeah. like self-educating, but yeah, with I actual am teachers. Yeah. You I, know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. And I am self-educated. So it, I guess at the beginning, people were like, wait, this is Chrissy Snow. Exactly. How could this possibly be? <laughs> Patrick, packaging was wrong. <laughs> right. But it is acting. Yeah. Yeah. Packaging was wrong also for renegotiating my contract with ABC because, um, I, you know, when I went in and said, you know, I'm... I'm on the number one show. The men are making 10 to 15 times more than me. They're, they were negotiating with Chrissy Snow. I mean, they weren't actually. They were, my husband was, the, and our lawyer was in the meeting, but they were negotiating with Chrissy Snow. And it became a, who does she think she is? It was almost like, she's lucky she had a job. She's the dumbest woman in America. And I'm thinking, no, 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 I was acting. I was really good at it. Right. I morphed into this character. I became so convincing that you really think I am that, but I'm not. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that obviously, that's crazy though. But okay, let's back up a second because yeah. that's such a big story. And today, because it was then, it was yeah. like, what, 1980 yeah. or something like yeah. that. And now it would, of course, be like all over the news. Like, what are you kidding me? Yeah. You can't pull this off. You can't, they can't do that. I would that. own ABC if it was today. Right. <laughs> but back then, no, I was the you, first were, one. So you were the first one. Yeah. Okay, so let's, the story was you were on the show for how many Six seasons? Years, and I signed for anything. I didn't care what they paid me. I wanted the job. And, and when you are first starting out, you will. And you don't, you'll take any part. Mm -hmm. you don't, you're not discriminating or, or discriminatory. You, uh, fine. You, I play a monkey, great. But, um, and I didn't know much. Like I'm sitting here in this studio here, and I never studied acting. Although I took one acting class when it was, Stra it was a Strasbourg acting class. But what I did in that first year on Three's Company is I watched John Ritter. I recognized his genius. Uh, mainly his, his genius in all, uh, all aspects of it, but in terms of being a physical comic. He's right up there with Dick Van Dyke. The two of them are the best of our, of our era. And so I took the year. I was young and cute, so I could get by without knowing much. But I had a the one of the th three producers uh, took me under his wing because I said I don't know anything. I, I mean, I know you hired me from my interview, but I don't know anything. So he took me under his wing. And in that year, he worked with me the way, I uh, remember Nadia Komenich and her sure. coach. And, um, yeah, she was an Olympic gymnast. Olympic gymnast. And Gold so medal, I would sure. go do a scene, and he'd be standing on the sides, and he'd either, you know, say, come here, or do a thumbs up or a thumbs down, and that. And then we'd commiserate. And so he taught me a lot. But I didn't realize in that first year that he fell in love with me, but in the way that a father de desires his daughter but knows it's wrong. So he never came on to me. So I wasn't really aware of it until the end of year two when I said to him, I'm going to marry Alan Hamill. And he said, why are you doing that? Why would you do that? It's going to ruin your career. What works for you is that you're single. Don't do that. And he's this and he's that. He had all these negative things to say. And I remember thinking, what do you care? You're like my father. Well, you know, you're uh, to me an old man. And um, that came to bite me on the butt in negotiations. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, shoot, shoot a history there five now. Five years where now uh, this guy is negotiating with Alan Hamill. So, Think about it. Now, who is this guy? Can you reveal okay, his name? Okay, so yeah. Yeah, because he's dead, so it doesn't matter. The uh, production team was Nichols, Ross, and Wes, and he was Mickey Ross. And he's old vaudevillian. In fact, he looked 
then, like Alan looks now, it's interesting. He was Jewish with the cool silver curly hair, and he swam in the ocean every day, and it was in good shape and everything. But to me, I'm in, I'm 20 yeah. something, maybe 22 or something. I, he's way too old for me. Never even thought about. Never even thought. Of, I was in love with Alan Hamill from from the moment I met Alan Hamill. So it was this this strange thing. But he, I imagine so many so many men would have been attracted to you. Because I was so naive. Well, not just because you were so naive, but you were a beautiful woman. Maybe. So you still are. But Maybe. then yeah. it was like, yeah. you're right there, but you're right. Because you were naive on yeah. top of it. Yeah. It was even maybe more yeah. easier for them to feel like they could whatever. And I, and I, I, I was so, uh, 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 gr- uh, I had such gratitude to him for teaching me. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. So this means so much to me. I was that girl. And, um, and he taught me a lot. I still am grateful to him. He did. Yeah. So you got to be, you'd be better then from mm-hmm. it. You gain oh, from it, even totally, though it was a big loss. Totally, totally. It wasn't until that meeting um, when Alan went in to, with the lawyer to renegotiate my contract, which had to be renegotiated. It was up. I didn't have a contract anymore. So he had no idea that you were coming in and you were going to ask for money. Well, the night before the meeting, my husband gets a call from a guy who's the CFO at ABC. And he said, you didn't hear this from me but they're going to hang a nun in the marketplace and it's going to be Suzanne. And so the next day when Alan left, he stopped at the door uncharacteristically and said, you know, this could all blow out of the water. And I said, no, it's a negotiation. We're asking for this. They'll counter with that. We'll counter and we'll meet in the middle and it'll all be okay. And um, what we didn't know was Laverne and Shirley had renegotiated shortly before that. And as Alan describes, they gave uh, ABC a colonic. They just got the greatest deal ever. The deal, uh, the deal I wish I could have gotten. What was the deal? End. Do you oh, remember? It was, it was huge uh, weekly salary, but huge back end and, you know, rich for life deal. Rich for life deal. And um, so that's why they had decided... Let's take Suzanne, who's the number one female on television right now, and make an example. So no woman will have the audacity uh, to ask for parity with the men. So we walked into that. So Alan sits down at the meeting, and I wasn't there, but I can see it. So it's the ABC lawyer, it's Alan, it's the, the Mickey Ross, and I guess other lawyers, I don't know who, but these are the main players. And Alan sits down, he said, you know, number one show and highest demographics of all women in television right now, and uh, she's been on approximately 55 national magazine covers every year, she's had her own special, she's ABC, that she's been on 2020 and featured on 60 Minutes, I mean, all over the place. And he said, and... Um, she would like to be paid, you know, commensurate with the men. And he gave a price, which was reasonable, less than what the highest paid man was getting, and a small percentage of the back end. Do you remember the numbers? Um, I don't, I think, I think we were asking for 150, but Alan Alda, Alan Alda and, um, uh, what's his name, Archie Bunker, uh, Carol, Carol O'Connor, O'Connor. Yeah. were making 350 a week. A week and owned and big back end. So this wasn't outrageous. This wasn't like trying to. And what were you making before? Do you not, remember? Uh, it, 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 like nothing. It, nothing. Yeah. And and to even say it, it, the, the average person goes, well, that's not so bad. But in the big picture, um, I I wasn't being paid commensurate with the amount of tickets I was selling. And you know, I was more interested. I wasn't so much a, a feminist. It was. I, this business is about selling tickets. I was selling more tickets than anybody, male or female. I was selling more tickets, so why am I not being paid for that? And I was delivering, and the character was beloved. They lo- loved, everybody loved, loved her. Chrissy. And I had really thought about how do you make a dumb blonde likable? Yeah. And I gave her a moral code, what she wouldn't, wouldn't do, and her outrage, and she'd never tell a lie, and she'd never steal your boyfriend, and she'd never betray you. If she was your friend, she was your friend, and she had this outrage at things. Everybody understands that. You can see it in eyes. Right. And, and the audience would react before I'd even say it, as Chrissy. That's when you're under their skin. They so understood her heart and soul. So she's a valuable character. They don't come along often in anything, movies, television, anything. So I'm sitting at home, and there are no cell phones at that time. 
And um, the, the three hours just were in an eternity to me. And there's a day, a way the front door opens when it's good news. And there's a way it opens when it's bad news. <laughs> and I lived in a multi-level beach house. And I hear the front door creak open, oh, and creak yeah. close. And I heard him slowly padding up the stairs. So I met him at the landing. He looks at me and he goes, you're out. <sighs> I said, I'm out. He said, you're out. He said they were going to fire you when I walked in. They and were going to fire you no matter what? No matter what. Not just not agree to the raise, yeah. but fire? Yeah. They wanted, they wanted, I, I, they needed a patsy. And so, man, I, I mean, for almost a year, I had a little pity pot going, why did I do it? Why did I, who did I, who did I think I was? And their machinery was so powerful. Their PR machinery, she's greedy and she tried to ruin the show and who she thinks she is. And so the public was getting mad at me for taking away this chemistry and not one woman, not one woman uh, stood up for me. And now I get it because they're all afraid too, but this whole uh, women in film and national mm -hmm. organization now and all that, not a peep really? because of the packaging the because packaging, of the packaging the packaging oh. the i'm you know i'm wearing short shorts and little suspenders and and i'm playing a woman child and they i i, I, it, I thought she was delicious in her innocence in her total innocence and um then one day i heard a voice in my head why are you focused on what you don't have why don't you focus on what you do have I thought, what do I have? And the voice says, you have enormous visibility. Everybody knows your name, not only in this country, but in many parts of the world. And it hit me of what a valuable asset that was. Wow. Here, as people are trying to make their, their name known, I'm known. Everywhere I go, still, as a fired actress. Hey, Chrissy, we love you, all this stuff. So I said to Alan, I would like to do a Vegas act. And he says, can you sing? <laughs> But he knew I could sing. <laughs> I'd been on specials. I got to work with mm -hmm. um, John Wayne, with Sammy Davis, with Frank Sinatra, Bob Hope. I mean, I was having a ball. I was just having a ball. And all that stopped because I lost my TVQ. So he went to Vegas. He made a two-year deal at the MGM Grand. He walks in after going to different hotels, and they all offer two weeks. But he walks into Bernie Rothkopf, who's an old mafia guy, when mafia ran Vegas. And Alan describes a long, long auditorium-like office with his small desk at the end, but nothing in but no furniture. And he walks down there, and Bernie's writing, and he's not even looking up. And Alan stands in front of him, and he, Bernie says, what do you want? He said, I want a two-year deal for Suzanne Summers, and I don't care what the money is. And he puts his pen down. He goes, why do you want that? He said, because I know that she'll succeed, and I need the, the time it takes to get her you know, up to speed. He said, nobody has a two-year deal. Well, anyway, that day, Alan ended up making a two-year deal with him for more money than we were asking for on Three's Company. We opened up, sold out. Uh, uh, they came twice a night because they got to see Chrissy. Mm -hmm. And I put Chrissy, I was me, but I brought her to life in the middle of the show. And I put the ponytails in in front of them. And I changed the posture in front of them. And uh, the skirt ripped off and now I'm in the short shorts and the eyes went wide and I had special material written. And uh, oh my God, they just loved it. So I was doing so great and Vegas in 1987 I became Las Vegas female entertainer of the year and Frank Sinatra was Las Vegas male entertainer of the year oh, that is a good imagine, company you're in imagine walking on that stage yeah okay that is so cool so also right so you walked away with some almost some intellectual property I guess yeah. they would call it right because yeah. they might have lost they said we don't need Chrissy Snow right, right. but Chrissy Snow had value oh, totally and so you got to walk away with that value yeah. with that product and before this all happened when we were putting um, uh, we were putting an act together that's right we were putting an act together um, but we hadn't seriously but we asked if we could have outtakes nobody had done outtakes before in fact Alan's partner at the time was Dick Clark and uh, Dick Clark 
uh, saw my outtakes and that's where he got the idea for bloopers, which was a huge success. Dick, oh, I love that yeah, show. Dick turns everything to money. Yes, Dick, and that Dick is the so, most, uh, that's right, it was on it show. dead. Dick, Dick is still making money. It, uh, it's, it, he's just <laughs> can't stop making money. Wait, so he made the bloopers show and that's the first time that bloopers were aired, right? Yeah. yeah. But now but people I will... was aired, But I had them in, uh, on my opening night, Dick came and saw the outtakes that I had been given permission to use whenever I had an act. You were given permission from Three's Company before, to use footage? Before the firing. Oh. And they had forgotten about it, but we had the permission. So I'm doing that's my show. And uh, that's such a successful part of the show to see the outtakes, because the outtakes were hysterical. And then we get a lawsuit, cease and desist. And so we had to remove, they were just, they were, they were crappy to me. Yeah. Well, you know, not enough to fire me, but then to, to portray me as greedy and who does she think she is? And then take away the out, like you get nothing. And I thought, all right, if this is business, I guess I got to develop a thick skin. But then I went on and really, really, really enjoyed nightclubs. I didn't want to go back to television, but television started doing this, beckoning me. And I went and I did a, crappy show called She's the Sheriff, which I hated the outfit and I hated the character, but it was, um, it was a, a foot in and then step by step came up and that was my other great husband, Patrick Duffy. Yeah, that was great too. Wait, can we get back to your yeah. first husband yeah. though? When yeah. I say husband, yeah. I'm doing it with air quotes, <laughs> yeah. um, to John Ritter. Yeah. So you learned from him, you're watching me, you knew right away when you were working with him that he's super talented and something special. So and you that's how I learn. I learn by watching great so what did he do? Like, what did you specifically it, observe? It was, it was timing. Timing is everything. His timing was perfect. And when I started really having chemistry with him, our chemistry was sparky. And um, I knew what he was going to do next. And he knew what I was going to do next. And uh, they, it got so they started really writing the show for Jack and Chrissy, which then created a little problem with um, Janet. Janet, because she's the, with all the training and she was UCLA and oh. she had the scholarship and she was the the everything. And I'm I come in and I'm the one who says I've never taken an acting course. And now I'm getting Golden Globes and uh, did I get Golden Globes? I think so. But I got People's Choice favorite actors or whatever. And and uh, Emmy nominations, and she's like kind of simmering over here because so I'm you the feel one. The tension, yeah, because I'm the. She's thinking I'm the one with all the training. But see, I don't know. I'm a person. It was better I didn't go to college. I'm not college material. It's better I didn't study acting because I'm organic. So when I watched John, that's great. When I watched Joyce, it was. Um, method and perfect but not organic john was organic john so john did he have training or oh no? yeah he yeah. did he what did kind of training i don't know i never really asked but him. he was a trained actor he, yeah he okay. knew how to do it but but it, it, it he just how do you describe genius he had genius i'm attracted to genius and who do I want to learn from, Joe Schmo over here or Genius? So I just just kept watching John and watching John. Then I've got the guy who's in love with me, coaching me. So I had a great support there. And then one day I heard it. I'm sitting there, I'm watching John, and I went, oh, comedy is musical. I've heard that I before. I am musical. It's set up, set up, beat. I heard the rhythm of it. And I started thinking about every time I get a huge laugh, it's because there's the rhythm is there. And so that was the first time the light bulb went off. And then here's the second problem with the guy who fell in love with me. I wanted to show him what a good job he did. So at one point, I stopped looking at him at the end of the scene to get my thumbs up or thumbs down because I knew I scored and I wanted him to know I can fly without you now. Like any good parent, at some point when, you're, when your little bird flies off, you should feel proud of yourself because you got them ready. But that made him mad. I'm in love with Alan Hamill. I'm going to marry Alan Hamill. I'm not, not looking to him for, you know, uh, uh, the thumbs up or thumbs down. So I don't know these are such problems over here because we haven't had that meeting yet. And then the meeting comes, and after Alan says, she's been on the magazine covers in 2020 and all that stuff, um, Mickey Ross, is his name, is smoking a cigarette in the um, lawyer's office. He smokes it like a joint. He'd smoke 
like that. He takes the cigarette, puts it on the floor of the lawyer's office, stomps it out with his foot, walks over to Alan Hamill, holds on to the arms of the chair, leans over nose to nose and says, you want me to share my blood with her? And Alan said, yeah. And that was when it blew up. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's sort of Shakespearean. <laughs> That's really something else. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So did you stay in touch with John after the show? No, because they created Mob Fury with the cast. She's trying to ruin the show. They never told them the truth. And even, um, I wrote a book a couple of years ago about Alan and I, and I talked about this, and uh, Larry, the, the neighbor. The Regal Beagle guy? Yeah, and he, he does an interview, and he said, Alan Hamill overplayed his hand, and they got greedy. And I'm thinking man, do you not know what happened? And Joyce didn't know what happened. Oh. And, and they all were mad at me. None of, them, none of them. The whole cast, the crew, wardrobe. I'm walking down the street one day on Rodeo Avenue, and the guy who dressed Chrissy Snow, we had a, a rapport, because we were always thinking about what sh- would she and wouldn't she wear. He saw me, did an about face, and crossed the street. So what was went, the story? What did they tell them? The, the, they did not tell them the truth. Well, I don't know. You don't know what the fake I don't story know what was? The, but I know what they were putting out to the public. So um, I never talked to any of them until maybe 30 years later. I'm at the beauty salon having my hair colored. Now you know. I color my hair. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't tell anyone. <laughs> and I'm in the shampoo bowl, and the receptionist she comes up, and you have a phone call. And I said, can you take a message? I'll call back. She said, it's John Ritter. Yeah. So I get on the phone, and I said, John? And he said, hey, babe. And then he said, I forgive you. To which... I had a moment where I had to really put on my big girl pants because my insides were going, you forgive me. And I said, thanks. <laughs> that was me. And then he wanted me to be a guest star on his show, Eight Simple Rules. He said, we wrote this thing, it's a dream sequence, actually a nightmare. And in my nightmare, you and Joyce are in the, in the nightmare. And I said, so we haven't been on camera together now for 30 years. And now you want me to come back as a nightmare. <laughs> Was this the same conversation? This was at the hair salon? Yeah, hair salon. So it was all one conversation. All I'm one sorry, time. and yeah. then will you be on the yeah. show? And I, said, and I said, that's not the way I want to come back with you, but I'm so I'm emotional talking to you. And I've wanted to do something with you. And I feel there's no resolution that, the, that there's a, a whole body of people out there who were so hooked in, still hooked into that show today. I know it's weird because that won't happen anymore because no focus gets that, no show gets that kind of focus anymore. And um, I said, why don't you and I find the right project to do together? You know, maybe Jack and Chrissy meet one another on a street corner and they end up getting married. Let's like, just like, let's think of something. And he said... Actually, that's a good idea. And we decided to find a product, a project for one another. And a week later, he died. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. <sighs> and so then the wound, you know, let's stick the knife in the wound again. I, well, uh, how, did you, how did you feel when you heard he died? Uh, um, uh, I now know what heartache means. I had a heartache. But I was so glad that we'd had resolution. Yeah. I would not have wanted him to die. I really cared about him. Would not have wanted him to die with this ick. Mm-hmm. And so then, um, I, being Irish, funerals are really important. And um, so I call the producer of the Emmys, who I forget who it was. He's the guy who always produces. I can't remember his name. He started coming to see me in Vegas. It'll come to me in the interview. And I said... How about um, I come from the right, Joyce comes from the left stage. Um, We both wear black gowns, and a black and white comes down of John Ritter, and the three of us are united on the Emmys. And why don't we say goodbye to John that way? They, They didn't want that. They didn't want me associated with him. I, they didn't want me at his funeral. Um, they brought on Henry Winkler, like meant nothing to the audience. They were friends, I guess, but it didn't mean anything. And so we lost that opportunity. So 
I had resolution. The people around him still had ick, and they wanted to keep the ick going. And I, one of the things that I like about growing up is the wisdom that comes to forgive and let go of toxicity and toxic people. And that was just a lot of toxic energy that I didn't want in my life at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is interesting. And probably people didn't even know that you had talked a week before. Nobody knew. And that all was was looking good. Yeah. What about his family? Did you talk to his family at all after that? I started to get to know his wife, Amy, because their daughter and my granddaughter were going to the same school, so I would see them. It wasn't... Uh, over the top friendly, but it was cordial. Well, Jason Ritter was on the show. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, like, I guess it was maybe six months ago uh-huh. or something like that. And uh, he's a great kid. No, no, I guess he's not a kid anymore. Yeah, he's not a kid. I tried to get something going with him. I thought it'd be very interesting to do a series where I play Chrissy all grown up and I had married Jack Tripper and we had a son and it was Jason Ritter and that John as Jack, would return in hologram because hologram is like him being there. And I thought his estate will allow this. And wouldn't that be fascinating to have John and Suzanne Summers and Jason Ritter all in the same series and Jason would hear nothing of it, doesn't want anything to do with anything related to his dad. So that's not toxicity. That I thought was foolish. I thought it was not seeing the biggest picture because Jason Ritter, for all his talent and all his darlingness, he is not, he is not, made his way up and above. We, we all know him, but we don't know him like we could know him if we made a splash. And I'm always, you know, I'm a businesswoman. And so I think of marketing. What great marketing what did that Suzanne Summers is doing a series with John Ritter's son and John Ritter appears in a hologram. It's like they were going to do a Three's Company movie and recast it. And I said to my granddaughter, go get that part. Because marketing, you'll, I'll, I'll teach you how to be Chrissy. But the marketing of Suzanne Summers' granddaughter playing Chrissy Snow, you're going to be the one that's the focus of all the interviews and, and, and you're going to be the one that the focus will be on. Uh, it'll be rough because they're going to compare you, but you have the talent. You can, you, you'll know how to do it. So that movie didn't happen, so she didn't get that chance. But, uh, you know, you got it. it's show business. And when I used to go to Mickey Ross and say, you know, Chrissy Snow... Um, it should have her own clothing line. She should have totally. Chrissy Snow shorts yes. and T-shirts and suspenders and knee socks and snap-on ponytails. And, and he would, like his face would get ready. He goes, this is not about business. It's about the show. And I would think, not really. Okay, you would have become like a multimillionaire. Totally. Instantly. Totally. I didn't own the character. I didn't right. own, but I could right. have worked a deal for myself where right. we'd all do really they well. Have, they right. would have scored some scored, cash. And I would have scored yeah. and I would have been promoting it. And I know how to do that. So And that feeds the show too. Yeah. And it feeds the show. And the other thing I said to them, Al and I went in and, and I said, um, she's a cartoon why don't you do, you know, Chris, the animated Chrissy Snow on Saturday mornings and do that show? Uh, why don't we, why, Chrissy Snow should be a movie star. Why don't we do the adventures of Chrissy Snow or the adventures of Jack and Janet and Chrissy? Let's do, uh, you know, they did not understand business at all. And we were the first ones who really, I think Farah understood to some degree, but we understood. Farrah uh, Fawcett. Yeah, we, we understood marketing. And how to take advantage of all the different parts and um, and turn it into uh, revenue and have fun doing it. Yeah, and everybody's happy. Everybody benefits. Right, everyone benefits. And back then, it was right. Farrah Fawcett was probably one of the first. Yeah, Wait, what did she have? I'm not. Well, even she had a poster. A poster. Yeah, that's it. A yeah, she didn't have much else. Um, but like Jacqueline Smith, I think had a collection or she something. She started right? later on. She had the uh, skincare, and Jacqueline made a lot of money. Jacqueline did well. And um, I, we, Alan and I understood this all along. Uh-huh. And nobody was branding yet. Everybody's branding right, now. But now, yeah. 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 But you were before your time with everything, with, with everything. the negotiation yeah. for the equal pay. With everything. And for uh, the branding. Yeah. All right. So we were at step by step, though. So let's go mm-hmm. back to step by step because I know that some people will really want to hear a lot about uh-huh. step by step because it's, it's a beloved show. Yeah. It is. Who knew? Um, it, it was Friday night, TGIF. Thank God it's Friday. Um, 
I, you had to pull me off the Vegas stage to get me to step by step. Because you were it, having a great time performing in I, that way in yeah, the live events. Yeah. So I was able to keep my foot in the Vegas door and doing one nighters and, and then doing the show during the week because I had what, four or five kids? I can't even remember now. <laughs> I kept having kids. I don't know. I had a pig and a kid in the first year and a sister and a mother and poof, they just went away as happens in television. Um, there was a beauty salon attached to to the uh, kitchen too, that that kind of poof went away. And, um, but what I had on that show was Patrick Duffy, who, another Irish guy, we got along. It's that Irish thing. We got along so great. And okay. He was such a crush of mine when he was on Dallas. I'm oh, just saying. Yeah. I was too young to even watch the show. I think it's like <laughs> what my parents were like, you don't need to watch Dallas. I remember, <laughs> but he was like the man. Right. Well, he was, he had humor. Uh, he directed a lot of our shows. He's super talented, um, but he had rhythm. He had timing. Oh, so he had that timing, yeah. too. He didn't have John Ritter's timing, but he had years of experience of understanding the camera. He knew how to work that camera, and he's so good-looking, and he knew all his angles. And um, I really, I love working with him, and we became friends, the four of us. We would, you know, stay at one another's houses and go out for dinner, and, and uh, you rarely fraternize with your uh, castmates, but right. he was just right. fun, just fun. So that was, that was a nice, comfortable zone yeah, for you those years then, right? Everything was going smoothly. Yeah. And I'd been off television for a while. And so um, the price I agreed to for year one was fine. It was good because uh, I had other businesses going. But year two, uh, Tom Miller and Bob Boyan, who were the producers who did so many of the great sitcoms, they came to me and they were paying at that time, Patrick, let's say three, maybe four times more than me. That was okay because Patrick had been on Dallas. I thought, here we go again. They came to me and said, we're going to pay you what we're paying. Patrick. I didn't have to even negotiate. That's amazing. Yeah. What peace that kept on the set. Mm -hmm. I was never going to be mad at Patrick because I walked into that knowing the score, but, um, how classy of those guys. Bob Boyette is still very active on Broadway. And when I was doing my one woman show, I kept running into him and I, I, I care deeply about him. That's really something yeah. and unusual, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so how many years was that total that you did that show? Uh, six or seven. Okay. A long time, maybe longer than Three's Company. Uh huh. I was prepared to stay with Three's Company uh, forever. It, it, as long as we could keep milking it. Was, that show had the ability to go on and be one of the, the great successes of all time. They screwed it up. They spoiled the chemistry. They didn't understand the marketing business. Not any of them, John or Joyce, ever made any money. Joyce plays, you know, college theaters now. She didn't make any money. And if you go to law school, you're going to be a lawyer. And you're going to do well. If you go to med school, you're going to be a doctor and you're going to do well. You study acting or land yourself in acting. There's no guarantee for anything. So if you are lucky enough to hit and you get in a number one or a top 10 slot, um, that's your big opportunity to make maybe the one big windfall of your life. And um, that John and Joyce didn't, that, that, that when John died, he didn't have a big estate to leave to his family, and that Joyce uh, doesn't live any kind of luxurious life. It's not a terrible thing. She's not going to miss a meal, but I think you missed an opportunity because you didn't have the right people around you to understand what you had, what you had. So where does the thigh master come into play? Because that was probably a big, huge, th- huge and a, and opportunity a, and a huge, that you took. Yeah. I, um, so I'm now doing Vegas. I'm the star of the Moulin Rouge at this point, doing two Two By the hours. way, this is your water. Oh, I filled you. it up. It's clean. Okay, Don't worry. Great. But I know sometimes you're on stage, you don't trust it. But no, if you're I do. Thirsty. I do. I was doing two two-hour shows every night. Loved it. Loved it. I danced down the stairs with um, 80 dancers. Um, I think about 40 of them were guys in white top hats and tails. And I danced down singing I Love Paris in a big gown and jeweled thing and, and tears of, of ruffles behind me. And then, and then that ripped off and I went into this big... Uh, hot, hot, hot flamingo dance with the fruit hat. And I mean, when do you get to do something like that? I did it for two years, but I started getting tired 
You know, I, I, um, lost a lot of weight. I was weighed under a hundred pounds and I was having to wear shorts under my gowns to make me look a little fatter. So when I were driving home we at that point had uh, built a ranch outside of uh, the strip to have a normal life. And, um, I said to Alan, we got to find a way for me to make money where I don't have to show up. And he said, you mean passive income? And I said, whatever. So, um, I don't know if he found the thigh master, but somehow the thigh master got to us. It was being pitched to us as an upper body device. And upper I think, body. yeah, for pectorals, arms, okay. arms. And I was just for the first time, I had done the Paul Anka special and I was walking down the cobblestone streets of Monte Carlo in short shorts. And I noticed walking that my inner thighs were jiggling. I'd never seen that because when you're not walking, you don't see it. And I went, well, what's that? And so while this woman is demonstrating this upper body V toner, it was called. I said, is that good for the inner thighs? She goes, oh, yeah, it's great for the inner thighs. I said, but people are really interested in, in their pectorals. And I said, no, not women. I said, we want those thighs tight. So here's where Alan and I, I think I named it thigh master. He thinks he named it thigh master, but who cares? <laughs> who cares? We put it on and we're trying to figure out how to market it. And I had bought a pair of Manolo Blahnik shoes, um, and in the early 80s, $565 was and still is a lot of money for a pair of shoes that are plain. Pointy toe, toe cleavage, just the right arch, just the right heel. Makes your legs look long and beautiful. Same color as your skin. Always believed in that, especially if you're not a tall person. Elongate. So I'm looking at these shoes and I thought, Alan's going to think I'm so stupid for spending almost $600 on a pair of perfectly plain shoes. So I walk out of my dressing room in my bra and underpants and I said to him, you like my new shoes? <laughs> and he said, great legs. And I went, that's the commercial. So if you ever see the commercial, I'm wearing those shoes. Um, they pan up my legs with off camera, Alan Hamill going, great legs. And I go, thank you. It's my thigh master. Um, and I got to ride off the shoes. <laughs> so it was a real First it was a reenactment. And then we sold uh, at last count oh, well over 10 million of them. It hit the wow, it 10 hit million. The, it hit a chord. So with, it was totally your own, so you owned it completely it. like yeah. really. Yeah, we didn't originally, you maybe knew you originally had. we had partners uh -huh, and the uh -huh. partners got so drunk with money when the money was coming in, they spent all the money and then it started going into the legal reserve and pretty soon they they bankrupted themselves and so we came in and scooped the whole oh. thing up. And who really sold it were the comedians. David Letterman would do thigh master jokes. I remember one night Jay Leno used it. He said the thigh master juice squeezer, and he was making orange juice with the thigh master. And everybody was doing thigh master <laughs> jokes, and every time they did it, cha ching. And then one night we come home for on the road, and I'm lying in bed. It's like three in the morning. We turn on C-SPAN because that's the only thing that used to be on at three in the morning. That was before Netflix. And there's George Bush Sr. at a state dinner in in a white tie and tails, and he said the reason Marlon. Fitzwater isn't here tonight is that he busted his thigh master and I went I can't believe we got the president of the United States selling thigh masters for us so so um, that yeah, that yeah. was our first foray into um, merchandise uh -huh. branding. Uh, branding and now I owned we owned Suzanne Summers. I didn't have to ask permission from anybody. Can I use the character? We own Suzanne Summers and we branded Suzanne Summers. And I would have loved to have branded Chrissy Snow, but they were really too stupid to see the... Well, you didn't need Chrissy Snow as it anymore, turns out. Anymore. Yeah. I mean, I could still use her. Yeah. Can you imagine selling anything today as Chrissy Snow? I could sell it. I mean, I could, I mean... I'm back, you know. <laughs> I don't know that Chrissy Snow would get the reception today. Yeah, uh, you would think, but get in an elevator with me here in New York. It's, but you're Suzanne Summers. Yeah, you're maybe that. Maybe that's what I'm maybe, saying. Oh, I think Suzanne Summers oh, now has maybe more she, value. Oh, maybe she's bigger than yes. Chrissy Snow. Maybe. Yeah. Probably. I think you outgrew Chrissy probably. Snow. Probably. You think so? Yeah. Probably. Uh, yeah. Who knows? But yeah. anyway, all I know is um, you can't know this until you do it. Our, these careers are high and low and high and low. You learn nothing at, at the high times. It's fun. Mm -hmm. You're so busy working and having fun and getting paychecks and things. It's when you dip down that um, you see who you really are. 
a lot of people, when they take the dip, they get depressed and they're a victim and why me and why bad things. For me, it became the, here's where you learn. Here's where you learn and grow is from the low, the low times. And I now have been around long enough and I plan to be around a lot longer to know that when you, you hit um, the top almost, you really have no place to go but down. Don't go down. Go right or left. Reinvent. And uh, the reinvention has been so interesting. Did I ever think I'd be this writer? Did I ever think? Yeah. Um, you know, I just recently was asked to speak to 7,000 doctors in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I teach doc. I teach doctors because I've, I, in an autodidactic way have, um, my focus is narrow, but it's a focus that the doctors don't learn in medical school. And it's what's missing in allopathic medicine. There's no room for uh, decline in hormones, decline in nutrients, decline in minerals. Um, it's all about here, allopathic is here's the problem, here's the drug for the problem. I've come in with, let's, let's only go to the, the drug when absolutely necessary, but along the way, let's do lab work and see where, where the, the values are and see where the ratios are. And I, I understand that in a way that surprises me. I, 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 when I wrote this book, you know, my first books, um, they were never done. They were never right. Can I have a little more time? Can I add a little more insecure author? Uh-huh. I, I, I now know when now they're done. Got it. So how did this start? Was it when you were diagnosed with cancer? Is that what started your interest in the whole medical and health field? Medical and health, cancer was my veiled gift for sure. But I had been, I'd been writing books since 1973. Yeah, I wrote, you have 26, is that right? 27. 27. Um, 1973, I wrote a book called um, Touch Me, Poetry, Feelings and Emotions. It was really because I was sad. And um, I, I had a, a childhood I've written a lot about, a child of an alcoholic. And... Um, I wrote about feelings and emotions because my childhood, a lot of it was spent hiding in a closet. We had a closet upstairs that was specifically for hiding. My mother had my brother put a lock on the inside of the door. So the nights when my father was especially violent and alcohol made him mean and violent. Um, my mother would come and uh, get us out of bed, get, get in the closet, get in the closet, get in the closet, all this nervousness, and we'd go run and get in the closet. And um, that, that, that had a profound effect upon me. My older brother and sister don't seem to be as affected by it as I was, but m myself and my younger brother, who eventually died, he, he, uh, he really, he didn't make it. Um, I, 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 I know... I don't know what depression is per se, but I know what fear is. I was terrified as a child. I was terrified of the night because you didn't know when you went to bed what the night was going to bring. And you prayed that you weren't going to be it because if you were it, you were the focus of his rage. And so I became this adaptive, who do I have to be daddy so that I'm not it tonight? I could tell how much he had to drink by looking at the back of his head. I was, that's what a child of an alcoholic does. We don't live our own lives. We live the life that I think you want me to live to fit into your paradigm of who I should be. So what did you see on the back of his head? How did you know? I just knew how much he had to drink. Just, just by, by the way, it was, was over here. Mm -hmm. If it was here, if it was, if it was tight, I knew everything. Um, so feelings and emotions were something that were all inside me. So when I wrote the book of poetry, never thinking it would become a best-selling book of poetry and it should not have, I wanted to, I was so in love with Alan Hamill and I'm living in Sausalito and I have a little baby at this point and no husband and no money, no money and no education. And um, Alan was just getting out of his marriage, and he was never getting married again, as they all are when they first get out of their marriages. And I'm never getting married again. And it was okay with me. I'll take you any way I can get you. And I read in the trades. Don't know why. Don't know how. I didn't subscribe. Where did I get it? I don't know. Somebody must have left it at my house because I lived in Sausalito. They're looking for a guest star on the Dom DeLuise show, just a one part. Um, small town girl, doesn't know who she is, and doesn't know what she looks like. And I thought, that's so me. So I 
thought, I'm going to go on that interview. So I said to Alan, because I don't know anything. I don't have an agent. I don't have anything. I said, I have an interview uh, Tuesday at 2 o'clock at NBC Burbank, and I'm going to fly down. He said, oh, I'll pick you up, which is all I really wanted. I just wanted to spend the night with him. So he drives me to Burbank, and um, I bluff when when you're uh, I wasn't bluffing because I uh, I said to the guy at the gate why are you here I'm here for the Dom DeLuise show I said it with confidence because I don't know I'm not supposed to be there oh park over there I go into the interview all the girls who are sitting there are much better looking than me but I watched what they did again watching they signed in and the receptionist gave them a script so I signed in they gave me a script I get called in by uh, Sam Denoff who I eventually ended up working with Sam Denoff and Bill Persky two incredible comedy writers, like the, one of the best in the business. And so I finished reading, and Sam Denoff says, very nice. I have no acting lesson at all. I thought, I know. I'm a small-town girl. I don't know who I am, and I don't know what I look like. <laughs> I just read it and believed it, which is what I did with Chrissy Snow. I read it and believed it. It was like playing house. We girls know how to play house. I loved playing house. That was my favorite game throwing up. You be the mom, I'll be the dad, and you be the baby. And... Um, so the receptionist, he said, I'm going to give you a call back. And I said, thanks. And I go out to her and I said, I have a call back. And she, and she said, good for you. I said, what is that? She said, <laughs> we're going to call you back. I said, when? She said, well, like today? She said, yeah. Uh, oh, so where do I go? Now I'm irritating her. I'm her problem. She said, I don't know. And the next thing she said to me changed my life. I don't know. Why don't you go wait in the commissary? Irritated. Oh, oh, okay. Something happened in the commissary. Who would you meet? Sitting there all by myself. It's three in the afternoon. Nobody's in there. Nobody. And in walks Johnny Carson. And I can't, I mean, I've never seen a movie star like that. And I'm thinking, oh my God, there's Johnny Carson. There's Johnny Carson. And then I thought, oh my God, Johnny Carson's walking over to me. And he comes up to me and goes, hey, little lady, what are you doing here? And I said, I have a callback because I have lingo, right? And, um, I, Dom DeLuise, oh, he's a friend of mine. I hope you get it. So I had no eight by 10, but I had my little book of poetry that I somehow got published and I just handed it to him. That was Wednesday. And so you, ca- you had that with you? Yeah, because I didn't have a picture. Because I didn't have a picture to leave. So you wanted to have something, something. in your hand. Yeah, and it's, it's a book. That represented you, right. yeah. Um, and I only had one credit to my name on the back flap, so I put it there. So that was Wednesday, Friday night. I was booked on the Tonight Show, my first national TV oh, that's a night debut. Show. And I didn't own a dress, so I wrote a bad check for seventy-five dollars. That's a child of an alcoholic thing. I'll figure it out later. You live unrealistically. And um, where'd you get it? Some crappy little shop in in uh, Sausalito. But when you're twenty. Anything looks good on you. And it was a one shoulder knit to the ground. I didn't wear a bra because I didn't need one. I didn't even think about I'm not wearing a bra. I just didn't need one because you're 20 and they just look amazing. And I'm standing behind that curtain, so nervous. I hope I don't throw up. And I hear Johnny Carson say, we've all been wondering who the mysterious blonde in the Thunderbird was while we found her. And the curtain opens. I had not even seen American Graffiti. It was one night's work. It was $136.72. I needed the money. That's all it was to me. Oh. And so... So you had done that how, You had done that before I'd done it, this? Yeah, I'd done that be, before Three's Company. Before, it was 1973. I wrote a book of poetry. Uh-huh. I knew a poet, Jim Cavanaugh. He put me in touch with his workman publishing. They liked it. But I went out on the meeting with the two guys who were the publishers. And it was like I was invisible. They're sitting there at the cock and bull is the restaurant they took me to. And it's all one of these noisy where all the men go and drink scotch. And, and they're talking like I'm not there. They go, you know, it's a good gimmick that with the way she looks. And she got a book of poetry and we could sell that. It wasn't about me. It wasn't about the poems. So I got it published. And um, uh, I sat down with Johnny Carson and he just loved me in the best kind of way. He never came on to me or anything. And his first question was, well, when did you get to town? And I'm literal. I said, today. (laughs) I got here today. (laughs) And he started having me on every month, reading him poetry. And he'd have an isolated camera on himself. And he'd do sad faces and pretend like he was crying when I'd read to him about feelings and emotions. Touch me not like a tree or a thing or even a flower. Touch me like a woman. And he'd be 
doing all these things. And my book of poetry became the number one best-selling book of poetry in America, along with Rod McEwen. And then I started doing a show every month. And, and so you were being serious when you were reciting your yes. poems. Yes. Did you know that he was like... I was his straight man, but I was a straight man. It, yeah, yeah, you really were. Yeah, and I didn't... I, I guess I knew he was... I wasn't stupid. I guess he, I knew he was... Mm -hmm. But, but I, it was he, fine. Yeah. yeah, it was fine. Mm -hmm. He was making fun of me, but he wasn't making fun of me. He was having fun with it. Yes. And what, whatever. Just mm -hmm. keep... I needed... His show paid a little more. I think it paid 300 and something, and that way I could pay my rent. This is... It was all about money. And... Um, uh, and one of those many, many, many times over a couple of years, Fred Silverman, as he tells it, was watching. And they had hired two Chrissy Snows for Three's Company. Neither of them tested well. And as Fred tells it, he said, I got the girl. I see her on The Tonight Show all the time. And that was that. And that's how writing books started. Okay. So you actually, do you like the writing process? I can't not. You can't not. Like I got five books in my head right now. Because it's a process. I yeah. mean, it's not easy to write. It, it, it actually is for me now. Like this book, which I think this book, A New Way to Age, is my best book so far. But maybe it's just because I've written so many. But I just knew this summer when I was looking at my computer, I thought it's done. I said what I was going to do. And this one is interesting because there are interviews in it. So it's not yeah. just your writing. Yeah. You didn't yeah. have to actually yeah. uh, write every word in the book. No, I don't. I don't. I'm not a doctor. I'm not an uh -huh. expert. I'm learning with you. I'm us. Right. But you could have, you know, which I think would be harder and less. Uh, it's, it's easy for everybody to understand it because it's straight from the doctor. Totally. Rather than you could have had the whole, it would have been a big project for you to have to explain everything and just insert quotes from doctors. You know what I mean? Yeah. You had to take the information they gave you and then figure out a way to communicate it to the reader. Whereas because it's the direct words of each doctor, it's... But have you ever had a doctor explain anything to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they, they are incoherent. They're very right. few. Well, that's why it's a, some... Like, isn't Alan Alda trying to do a thing? Isn't that one of his purposes, his missions, is to help doctors be more, better communicators. That sounds very Alan Alda-ish and good for him. And I understand it. And that's what I do with my doctors. I have used my fame to get to the best and the brightest. And I realize that anyone will take my call. And I realized that when I wanted to talk to Ray Kurzweil, the famed uh, futurist, I called MIT, cold. Ray Kurzweil. I got shunted around, shunted around. Finally, I get to his office. Who's calling? Suzanne Summers. Do you have an appointment? No. What's it regarding? Tell him I'd like to speak to him about being the most fascinating man on the planet. Oh, that's a nice hook. Hi, Suzanne. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, uh, be, I, 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 I have our Irish charm. And so they all end up liking me. And then I call them back again and again. You know, when you said this, did you mean that? Because I'm writing this here and it's not making any sense. And I got to make it make sense to me. Otherwise, my readers will never. And then they explain. I, and I get their interviews understandable. That's mm -hmm. my talent. So you'll record them. You'll record the conversation, what mm -hmm. they're saying. Then I have then it transcribed. It. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I put split screen and I read here. I start editing. That's a good one. Put that there. Um, don't need that. Oh, that went on way too long. Oh, that's interesting. Put that there. Because plus people don't speak in sentences. No, no. Then I give them final approval and I have to. It's, uh, so this you know, is it's medical accurate. information. So, you know, when they sign off, they sign off on the information. So that's when they go back in and finish their sentences. I meant to say this, and they tweak it a little bit. Sometimes they get carried away, and they go on and on. And then I go back, and I go, this, you know, Too long. you lost me here. Yep. I, I, I had it here, like I had it at hello. <laughs> right. I don't need the whole rest. <laughs> yeah, can so you it's kind can of, you say all of that in about three sentences? Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So um, they love it. Because for all these uh, professionals have accomplished, they don't have as loud a voice as me. So I'm the conduit to get their information out there. I don't put them in there. I have, I have, there, are, there are doctors that I've eliminated because I look at it when I'm all finished and I go, it's, it's, uh, I, I, either I don't believe you or it's not compelling or one doctor I interviewed and then I found out she didn't know as much about hormones as... 
I thought she should. Mm -hmm. I was knowing more than her. And then I found out that she was sending hormones uh, out uh, through the internet. And I thought, that's not right. That's going to get me in trouble. And You mean selling them? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And um, so I just eliminated her. And so she, you know, it considers me an enemy. I'm going, you have to really see the part that yeah. you played in this. You, you were doing some underhanded stuff there, but you're lucky I didn't put you in there because you'd probably end up in jail. Well, you have to be careful too, Very. because all of the doctors there, if one is not on the up and up, it he invalidates she, everybody. Right. And yeah. validates not just you yeah. and your entire brand. I had two every in other this doctor. Book. I had two in this book I had to eliminate and I love them. But I'm reading the paper one morning and they both were involved in a Medicaid scam, you know, overcharging. Oh, how did you find out? I saw it in the paper or online or so wherever I saw it and I I called each of them. Yeah, I know, but it, I'm not guilty and they're and I'm Doesn't and I'm matter. and I'm and I said, I'm so sorry. And it's such a good interview, but I can't keep you in here because out of respect to all the other doctors and professionals in this book. So, um, I have, I have my ethics, you know? Yeah. And you know, you don't like, it's kind of scary too, right? Cause you don't, they, it was in the paper. Yeah. So they got caught. They got caught. But what about somebody who hasn't gotten yeah, caught and, yet? And, and if they hadn't told me, if they had, if I hadn't seen that, they, they would not have, have told, told me you, right. and they'd be in this book and I'd be pretty upset. Yeah. So the universe is looking out for me. And so, um, they're gone. Whoosh, whoosh. So do you think the universe is looking out for you in general? Mm-hmm. Because I'm listening. I I feel the energy. I, uh, you know, I'd really love to sing and dance and make people laugh. I love it. I love performing. I want another residency in Vegas. And God lets me do that from time to time. And then, then the God voice says, okay, get back to the work. I think I'm an unlikely famous person. I didn't go after it. I think I became famous. I think the show was so famous. I think my firing was so famous that um, I don't go away. And that gave me the ability to have this louder voice and keep reinventing. And I think what I'm doing now is what I've been asked to do. I understand my subject and I understand. I, I know if you read this book, you'll have a better quality of life. I know that. I'm living an amazing quality of life. And so is my husband. And it's all this stuff that I put in this book. And um, I'm not anti-drug or anti-pharmaceutical. When you need them, you need them. Like right now I have a fractured hip. I need to take pain medication. I hate taking it, but I need it. But um, if you don't need it, um, I'd much rather go natural. So I know most people want to go allopathic. It's safe. It's where you feel the most comfortable. It's where what we've all grown up with. Uh, nobody really ridicules you if you go, you know, a, a particularly chemical. When I turned down chemotherapy, I had to listen to Dan Rather talk about she's risking your life. I saw on the cover, I'm on the cover of People. Is she risking her life? Uh, Larry King and Andrew Weil were discussing she's risking her life. And, um, but today... Um, they're not going after me like that. I'm alive. I did it my way by changing the way I eat, changing the way I think, changing the way I sleep, changing the way I love, um, and the other things that I have gratitude for in my life. And um, I, 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 I don't know. I, it's not courage. It's I can't. The idea of chemical poisoning didn't and still doesn't and never will resonate with me. It just doesn't. If you could say to the doctor, uh, you just take this chemotherapy, and, and it, it, I'd always say to my reader, at that point you say, if I take this chemotherapy, will it cure me? They have to say no. They don't know. There is no cure. If it was a cure, it'd be all over the place. Chemotherapy is the cure to cancer. It's not. It's not. So this rolling the dice of let's try to kill it. We'll probably kill it and hope we don't kill all the rest of the cells. Like I'm watching friends now, you know, one of mine, we all know uh, um, Alex with uh, pancreatic cancer. I pray he lives, but I don't feel good about his choice, but it's You're not my Alex choice. Trebek? Yeah, it's mm -hmm. not my choice. And that's the choice that feels safest to him. And that's why he went that way. And that's what I respect. If that's, the, if that's what resonates for me, I couldn't do it. So what did you do for the cancer? I um, changed the way I ate. 
I did do radiation, which I wish I did not do. All the trouble I have with my health is radiation induced. Uh, my a breast surgeon says um, radiation is the gift that keeps on giving because <laughs> you get scar tissue, you get like hardening of, of fat and things from it. You get scar tissue. I got scar tissue. But the cancer is gone. Cancer is gone. But I've had a lot of cancer. It, it could come back. I'm not afraid of it. Um, I know what I would do if it came back. I had three bouts of cancer in my 20s, severe hyperplasia in my uterus. I had malignant mel melanoma in my 30s on my back. I had um, cancer in my uterus and had my uterus removed in my 40s. I had breast cancer, a tumor in my 50s. And in my 60s, I um, had DCIS in the other breast. How did I get rid of that? Coffee enemas and pancreatic enzymes. Now that makes me wacky, doesn't it? But I didn't have to have a mastectomy. It's been 10 years. I'm alive. Uh, my doctor, who I've written about three times in three different books, Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez, um, was just about to publish 126 case studies of, of stage four cancer, including pancreatic, of his patients who had been alive 10 years or longer on this protocol. And he mysteriously died. So what do you think I happened? think he was murdered. I think he was murdered. But uh, nobody wants By to touch whom? that story. Uh, people have a vested interest in, you know, a $200 billion a year business. You can't have some little guy in New York who's having people put coffee up their rear ends and taking pancreatic enzymes. But you know how it works? It's very interesting. I've studied this so much because I, I, I base my life on this. Enzymes eat debris. So if you take pancreatic enzymes, uh, porcine, which is pig is closest to the human enzyme. If you take pancreatic enzymes and um, away from meals, an hour away on either side, because if you take it with meals, it'll just digest your food. That's fine, but a waste of having 14 or 16 enzymes. But away from meals, enzymes eat debris. Cancer is debris. Chemicals are debris. Toxins are debris. And they got to eat. And so then they eat the debris, and then they've got to, for lack of a more charming way of putting it, poop it out, right? The coffee enema cleans and detoxes the liver and gets the debris out of the body. So it's a constant detox. Feed it right, clean it out. Feed it right, clean it out. When I went to his funeral... He was in one of the upstate New York, one of those little churches that looked like George Washington went to church there, packed with his patients. Not one person looked sick. Not one person was gaunt. Not one person with that whole terrible, I have cancer look. No, not one gray person, not one cane, not one wheelchair, not one anything. Color, because when you're detoxing your liver every day, your skin looks great, your color is great. And then the reception after was one story after another. 26 years ago, I was told to get my things in order, and I started this, and I never looked back. And um, belief is a big part of everything. But for me... I believe in this, clean it out, feed it right, clean it out, uh, whereas I don't believe in let's try to poison it out and hope you, the rest of you doesn't die with it. Yeah, so no regrets there. None. At all. I'm alive. Here yeah. I am. And, I, and, and the biggest fear most people have is cancer. I don't have that fear. And, and even if I got a diagnosis again, it'd be like, all right, well, I'll up the protocol. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'll be okay. I'll be okay. Mm -hmm. what a, what a, a talk about peace of mind. So then you wonder why I'm writing these books. Because belief is such a huge part of who we are. And I believe in everything I write about. Um, when I get, you can't even imagine the people who've called me. Famous people, like unbelievably famous people call me when they are in the last stages of, do you think you could help me? I go, I can't help you. I'm not a doctor. But if I had your cancer, I'd go see this guy. Or if I had your kind of cancer, I'd go see that guy. So or these are people you know, or these are just Usually random? cold calls. Like, like, like I, I, can't, I can't say who they are, but like, think famous of the most famous. And when I get a call like that, it doesn't shock me or anything. Uh -huh. I go, hey what's up? And I always know what they're going to say. Um, same thing with people's guts, same people, same thing with, um, hormones. I've, Oh, so many women. So people call you, they'll call, 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 they call, call me you. like I cold yeah, call yeah, doctors. Exactly. Yeah. Why not? So, that, so when you say, 
this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Uh huh. So you feel like you're exactly where you. Yeah, yeah. I don't know where it's going to go, but I know right now the fact that this book fell out of me. It so this book is called A New Way, a to, new way age. to Age. And, and again, I, now it's just released. Yeah, just released. And um, I, I'm 73 and I love it. And I realize um, that I, I'm not aging the way uh, 73 used to age. I like the way I look. I don't think I'm terribly wrinkled. I have wrinkles, but it's not bad. I don't look in the mirror and <clears throat> do that. I, um, I, I'm... I I have what no young person can buy or have, and that is acquired wisdom and acquired perspective. Invaluable. Invaluable. Right, but you only and, get that in time, over time. And you don't get it if you're all pilled up. And I'm not all pilled up, so my thinking is clear. I have clarity. And then I'm on hormones, which, which improves your clarity also. So my... Thinking is like a young person, but my wisdom is like an older person. And you put it together. That's what I'm trying to say in this book. Okay, so let's finish with a question that I like to ask. Okay, yeah. Because I think it's very interesting. I think you will too. What is the image people have of you? Who do they think Suzanne Summers is? <laughs> I don't know. Um I don't know what made me cry. I don't know why. What do you feel? I have no idea why that made me emotional. Let's figure it out. Um, I don't know if anybody can understand anybody else's journey. It's been such a journey of forgiveness for others, for myself. Um, I hope people understand I'm not screwed up. I've been screwed up, and I know what that feels like. I know that who that is, and I'm not anymore. I've worked really hard to not be screwed up. So I hope, I love being attractive, so I hope when they look at me, they think I'm attractive. And, and for my age, I want that, because I want you to know. It ain't over, and we keep, it keeps getting better. I want that. Um, and that, life is what you put into it. What's making you emotional about it? Is it how I have you no idea. people have perceived you over the years? I don't know. I've worked really hard to get to this. I, I actually have what I want. Is it that they don't, they think a certain way, they don't understand, and you've been trying? No, I think, I think they're finally getting me, and so you ask me who they think I am, I don't know. I hope they look at me and see how, God, I'm so in love and happily married, and I have this family that I work so hard to put together. Blended families, we're the first generation that blended families, and... Um, I didn't let it get me down, and um, I, I faced cancer several times, and I didn't let it get me down, and I, um, I think that I can offer hope. That it doesn't matter where you come from, no matter, you know, I grew up being told you're stupid, hopeless, worthless, nothing. You're a big O. That's it. That's probably it. Yeah, I'm not. That's it. I'm not. <laughs> Surprise me. I didn't know I was emotional about that. Um, um, but life is, life is, it's great. Life, life is really great. And I, I think what I love most now is that I'm respected, not by everybody, um, but I am respected and, um, man, that feels good. By the way, I think that's what it is. I was a therapist before I did this. Oh. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, here I am. So how'd you get me here? I feel like huh. that I'm just gonna give you my therapist mm -hmm. feedback. Mm -hmm. I think it's what you just said about what you were told, who you were told you were Yeah. when you were growing up. Yeah. 
Yeah. And I got the I'll show yous. Yeah. And, um, and I, I don't need to show anybody anything anymore mm -hmm. now. It's, um, I, I, if uh, I've got your back and I, and what I tell you, I'm telling you from such good faith mm -hmm. and such belief and you don't have to follow me or believe me. So who told you those things when you were growing my up? My dad. Your oh, my dad. dad. So all specifically your dad. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. And I, oh, by the way, I loved him. Yeah, of course. Loved him. We, I didn't want a did. new dad, but he was just, he, by the time I came along, he was um, just a violent alcoholic who couldn't stop. He couldn't control it. And my mother uh, couldn't make him stop. Nobody can make him stop. Uh, it, it all happens the way it happens in therapy. I've had a lot of therapy. And I've been taught to uh, take responsibility for the part I played in all of it. And I've not been perfect. Nobody's perfect. And one day I said to my therapist, I try so hard to be perfect and I never hit the mark. She goes, well, welcome to the rest of us. Yes, <laughs> there is no mark. Yeah, she said, the God is doesn't... perfect. There is, after that, there's nothing. And that was very freeing for me because when you are a child of an alcoholic, you just, if I could just be perfect, you wouldn't have to drink so much. Yeah. But absolutely has nothing to do with it. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. All right. So the second part of the question is going to be easier for okay, you. Okay, right. Or maybe it won't be. I don't know. I don't either. The second part is, who are you? Who is the real Suzanne? Oh, I'm fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> I've never wanted, I don't want to be anybody else. There's nobody I look at and wish I was them or had their life or anything. I, uh, I like the way I think. I like my brain. I love my life. And every morning, I know that we are 40 trillion cells approximately. And every morning, I know they all talk to one another. I take one cell. I've been doing this for 15 years. And I tell that one cell, I love my life. I love my husband. I love my family. I love my work. I love that I live in America. I love the food I get to eat. And I just go through a litany of what I'm grateful for. Then I release it. And then it has to go tell all the other cells. Has to. And conversely, if I said I hate my life and life sucks and my husband sucks and all that, it would have to go tell them all that too. So then I realize I'm in total control of my happiness or unhappiness. Whatever it is, I choose it. We all choose it. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Suzanne. Thanks. Wow. Wow. I didn't know about I That surprised me. Very emotional. Maybe because I was digging it all up, you know. Yeah, you were digging it all up. Plus, you were on this, like, you're, you've been so busy probably since yeah. you came here. Yeah. That it's like, you didn't have time to process anything. And right. maybe making you feel emotionally even on top of that. Yeah, could be. So. Good therapist. Thank you. But. You know, I think it's good to get yeah. to... When I did my one-woman Broadway show, uh, there, were, uh, there were three characters. It was me, Alan Hamill, and my therapist. She saved my life. Most people don't tell their therapist. So their mm -hmm. therapist may see some of it happening, mm -hmm. yeah. but they won't know that years later, they're still, they, their impact is yeah. still felt. So I'm sure she appreciated it, even she had if to. she felt a little bit strange being validated, like out of the closet. Yeah, validated yeah. her yeah. life's work. The last time I ever saw her, she said to me, this is three years in, I don't want you to come anymore. I said, why? I pay. She was charging me according to my ability to pay, a dollar a visit for both me and my son. But she had let my son go two years earlier because he had been run over by a car and that's why we went. We didn't go for me. I, I wasn't worthy. I was for my son. And she said, um, I don't want you to come. I said, why? I pay and I, I'm doing so well. And she said, I know. I want you to go live your life. I mean, but, 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 no, I want you to go live your life. So I get, <laughs> I'm going to cry again. I get to the door and I hear her behind my back say, Suzanne. <laughs> and I said, what? She said, the worst is over. I got in the car. I drove home. And with each mile, I thought it is. It'll never be that bad again. And it never has been. Mm -hmm. So she knew when to let me go. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm not going to yeah. cry anymore. <laughs> that was Suzanne Summers. Thanks for listening. I'm Kara. Talk to you soon.